Services. I'm your host, Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and joining me is Dr. Darius uh, Spieth. Hello, uh, Dr. Spieth. Um, we're going to be talking about your book, uh, Napoleon Sorcerers. I'm already going to say it because, because I, we were already talking before the show about how you, in a way, sort of created this word. But the uh, Napoleon Sorcerers, the uh, Ephesians? Yes, yeah. Wonderful. I, I think it's going to be a really fascinating conversation uh, and something that, that people are really going to, uh, to find very interesting because I just, unless you've read Dr. Speed's book, even if you're really into this stuff, really into the esoteric, really into the history of the esoteric, I doubt that you've heard about this group. They're, they're very obscure, but very fascinating. So uh, I really love unveiling something that, that, that people, even people who really love this stuff, have never heard about. I think you people are going to flip your, your wigs uh, to find out about this, this fascinating, fascinating group. Uh, but before we uh, get to actually talk about them, I'll, I'll quickly give a plug for our Patreon. Uh, we do need your financial support to keep the show going you can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month we usually charge for about four, four or five three to five pieces of media we try to do more we've been busy lately but we try to do some more for free you get the shows early we don't give much more besides early access because we don't want to lock up content behind a paywall but that said you know if there's something you want from us let us know and you know we're always looking for ideas about what we can give our patrons you can do one-time donations at paypal.com slash gnostic uh, and you can help us out uh, in other ways that aren't financial, uh, telling people about the show, sharing it, uh, putting it on your social media, telling people about it. You know, the ear to mouth still works uh, very well, actually kind of works better than these other things. Uh, sending people your favorite episode, pop it in an email, send it over and be like, this is the one that I love. OK, the, the commercial is over, Dr. Steve. So I know that my first question is kind of what we're going to be spending the next half hour to an hour talking about. Yeah. But, but I guess if you could give us sort of the, the elevator pitch, the summation can you can you give us a brief summation of who and what was the sacred order the Sephesians? Uh, yes I'll try, I'll try. <laughs> uh, and it, it it requires a lot of contextual information I think you know first yeah. of all the first thing to say is the time period we're talking about Napoleonic France here and post Napoleonic France and that's very interesting because you know lots of historians have written so much about Napoleon and the Napoleonic age and then there's the restoration. There's somebody called Louis XVIII, who is a kind of relative of the royal family that was sent to the guillotine, who comes to the throne. And, and they are trying to turn back the, the clock, basically, going back to pre-revolutionary times. Uh, we also need to remember that the Sufisians, the members of this group, um, were uh, what I call the generation of the French Revolution. These were people who lived through the French Revolution and its aftermath, which is Napoleon Bonaparte, right? And so the restoration period, therefore, is politically a period about going back to the old regime. Uh, it's about going back to um, making Catholicism the official state religion, right? And and uh, the French Revolution was, you know, there were destructions of churches, for instance, um, and, and the Roman Catholic Church had uh, faced a lot of problems of various sorts. Uh, and um, so in any case, or even, you know, it's it's like going back to to the age when the king is kind of almost you know put in in in, in that spot directly by divine power so the sophisians are really napoleonic nostalgics right they are not of this regime they were largely or they came together mostly as a group of veterans of the egyptian campaign which is kind of the foundation if you want, of the Napoleonic age, but also many other uh, military campaigns of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. That is one very important component part, one background information. Um, the other part here is theater. And with theater, I mean boulevard theaters. Um, there is in Paris, the Temple District, which of course has its role in the history of the Knight Templars, and we can go endlessly into that, but I don't need to, and you can probably find better people to talk about it. But there is the Temple District in Paris where the Knights Templars had their headquarters, 
and uh, to the north there's the Boulevard du Temple. And one needs to know that uh, the Boulevard du Temple was the theater mile uh, in uh, a Paris after the revolution, basically uh, with the uh, revolution, of course, came freedom of opinion. And uh, we oftentimes think about newspapers and the press, but freedom of opinion also meant that you can put on stage whatever you want. And there, so there's a huge blossoming of these theaters and and um, these theaters are boulevard theaters in the sense that it's popular theater. It's not like, you know, high minded Racine, Corneille kind of stuff. Um, and they have what we would say, you know, tricks that they use, you know, thunder, you know, cheap kind of tricks. And uh, I believe very firmly that these boulevard theaters were the setting for the initiations of the Suffusions. So the group itself has its origins in the campaign of, in the Egyptian campaign of Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, which started in 1798. It's over already by 1801. Uh, it's a complicated story. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's basically the beginning of Napoleon as, as a political leader, as opposed to a military leader. There was a French revolution before, um, and then Napoleon is appointed the you know, general of the French troops stationed in Italy, he comes back. Uh, he's very highly regarded after that. And uh, there's a, a, a more moderate revolutionary government in charge. And Great Britain is kind of arch enemy and they are about to assemble troops to invade Great Britain. And they never do this. And they decide on this completely crazy plan, plan B which is to invade Egypt. And Napoleon Bonaparte is put in charge of that. And um, it turns into a disaster, right? The, the, you know, he basically takes most of the French Navy there. Uh, and Lord Nelson is in the Mediterranean trying to chase them down. Uh, and then they manage to disembark just outside of Abu Kir. And uh, then uh, the British uh, fleet finds them, shoots them to pieces. They can't get back, they're stuck in Egypt, and they march on to Cairo, they find a lot of resistance from the native population and also from a kind of warrior caste that's in charge and that's kind of has links to the Ottoman Empire, the Mamluks, and um, so uh, lots of native resistance from the Mamluks originally, uprisings in Cairo that they put down eventually Napoleon to, takes the troops further up north into what would be today uh, the Palestine territories, Israel, uh, these kind of areas, and probably wants to march on to, to Constantinople uh, or Istanbul for, for that matter, but he never gets there and he's kind of repelled limbs back and there's an outbreak of the plague and many, many soldiers die. And eventually Napoleon Bonaparte abandons his troops in Egypt in the middle of the night, comes back to France. You would expect he's being arrested, charged, but they celebrate him as a hero. And he takes this as a cue to basically overthrow uh, this directory government that sent him there. Um, and so um, the, uh, the, the Sufisians make the claim that they were founded in Egypt by uh, members of Napoleon's military. And there's about half a dozen or so members who we know were active members even 20 years later, uh, who were part of the Egyptian campaign. So um, it's plausible, but the group went through many changes, permutations over time. And it is a Masonic or para-Masonic organization. It, we're dealing here with Egyptian right Freemasonry, which is within Masonry, a very marginal, a very marginal ritual. And uh, so uh, what, what is special about uh, uh, e Egyptian right Freemasonry, there's still uh, some, there's still a right that exists today, Memphis Misraim, um, that follows this. Um, but nevertheless, uh, within Freemasonry, it's it's an absolute niche minority kind of thing. Um, and so, but what is the motivation of having an e Egyptian like Freemasonry? Well, 
it's the prestige of the age of Egyptian civilization that is all about traditionally uh, Freemasonry lays claim to have originated with the deluge and the biblical uh, story of the foundation of the earth. But then again, Egyptian monuments are older than that. And, and we are here, we're dealing basically with the pre-romantic, romantic age. So you have a lot of, you know, stories about finding new civilizations that are older than the oldest known civilizations and and uh, and and that that's that's a cultural phenomenon of the early 19th century and they're part of that and one needs to understand it in this context um so uh, in any case by making the claim that they were initiated inside the pyramids of egypt you kind of plug in and connect to the to, to a civilization and to mysteries that are older than anything that's known before, including even uh, the Bible for that matter. And that raises very interesting questions because there are also uh, natural scientists in this group. Um, some of them I describe as proto-Darwinists. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, there were lots of, in the 19th century, lots of controversy over uh, you know, there's the Dendra seeding, for instance. Um, that's a very interesting story. There were incredible uh, scholarly controversies over the age of this Hellenistic monument that's in the Louvre, how old it was, and whether it proves that, you know, uh, that there's Egyptian civilization is older than the foundation of the earth, according to the Bible, and so on. So in any case, um, so, so there is evidence that indeed there were some people who were in the Egyptian campaign who were on the membership lists, uh, even after, even during the restoration. Um, but the vast majority of the people who we know joined much later. And um, so, uh, in any case, that so possibly and presumably founded there, and then they keep on going until. Yeah, the early 1800s, and then kind of fizzle out around 1813, and they are being revived during the restoration. And the documents that we have, and that poses a little bit of a problem. There's mainly one document in the National Library in France, which is called the Golden Book of the Sophisians, mm -hmm. and that's a document from about 1819 or thereabouts. So it dates from the restoration period when there is uh, a playwright named Cuvier de Tri who revives this group. And um, Cuvier de Tri was a veteran of the Napoleonic campaigns, not the Egyptian campaign, but veteran of the Egyptian campaigns. Uh, he wrote plays and I mean, he wrote lots of plays, hundreds of them. He cranked them out for these boulevard theaters and he was connected to the composers who associated with these boulevard theaters. He was connected, obviously, with the military, and he becomes the driving force of this whole thing. And they create this illuminated manuscript, which is filled with these rebuses and images that basically you are being given to interpret as an initiate of this group in, in order to climb up the, 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 the different degrees that they have. So, so that's part of the exercise. And they're all Egyptian themed, but there's are references to Hermes Trismegistus, of course. Um, there's lots of references to Isis and, uh, you know, speculations about Isis, Isis. Sophia, of course, is personification of wisdom, strong ties to Gnosticism, needless to say, but Sophia for the Sophisians, Sophia and Isis are basically the same, right? And they stand for this personification of female wisdom and, and hence the name, the Sophisians, right? Mm. Yeah. So, so the golden book um, is this fascinating manuscript um, that, and I discovered it, I believe, at the end of the 1990s when I saw it for the first time. I'd never seen a document like that before. Um, and uh, I spent a lot of time and I found one article in a completely obscure Masonic journal from the 1950s 
there were a handful of people, Masonic archivists, who knew about the existence of this book. It's not like I rediscovered it. It was there, had an accession number, but nobody had looked at this. And, and so I saw this is fascinating. What is this? You know, the first, first response was, what is this? You know, I'd never seen anything like it. And, and of course, the, 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 the riddles, you know, the rebuses there became, you know, very interesting. You know, the books of Hermes Trismegistus and, you know, the whole thing about Isis. And of course, Isis is veiled and it's about the unveiling of nature. And that becomes a, 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 a kind of allegory for, um, uh, you know, uh, yes, finding, finding the natures of nature and what is the nature of nature, right? And, and uh, so where that came from, you know, uh, classical texts, Hellenistic texts. Uh, and uh, then, uh, so that was one part of the golden book. Another part is uh, stage sets. And they really look like stage sets. I think they were stage sets for the initiation itself uh, with um, all of the paraphernalia, of course, all Egyptian themed, right? And, and, and so, and there's a membership list attached to that golden book. And then I found more documents as I kept on looking, some very obscure printed things. There was another manuscript that turned up in the Netherlands. Um, and so uh, in, in any case, I kind of got hooked on that and, and I wanted to figure out what it is basically. Yeah. And and it, was that your way in? Was was stumbling across this this golden book? Like how the, how did you find it? You just saw it in the in the archives while researching something else, or you know, I'm just yes. so fascinated because you you know, how did you find out about as we talked about at the beginning of the show? As you just mentioned, there's only yeah. one one journal article you could find. Very very obscure gr group. Yeah. So yeah, so, uh, very good question. Um, I, at this point in time, I was writing a dissertation on on the first director of the Louvre, Vivant mm -hmm. Denon. And there's a Masonic dictionary by Daniel Legou, which is an entry on Vivant de Nord. And uh, basically, I was only interested in the question because there's some prints that have Masonic references in, in the work of uh, Vivant de Nord was also a printmaker. And um, so I, I wanted to follow up. And in, in, in this um, uh, dictionary entry, it says, was a member of the Auto Sacre de Sophision. Well, actually, he was not. He's at least, you know, I, I have no idea where it came from. But it's true that Vivant de Nord is, is part of the same milieu, right? I mean, the Sufisians didn't invent uh, Egyptian uh, right uh, Freemasonry. There was Cagliostro, which was a famous precedent, you know, and famous adventure in the 18th century. And so if you, if you look, if you want to look at a historical figure that is associated with the Egyptian right, that there's Cagliostro, right? Um, and and you can't get around him and the last prisoner of, or the last person who died in the prisons of the Vatican. There's the legends and myths about Cagliostro are, are kind of endless. And of course, that's what he used to tour Europe, basically, you know, as an Egyptian rite of his own making. And, and he set the precedence for that, no doubt, you know, and, and the Sufisians come after. They were not the only ones, interestingly enough, there were miniature groups uh, in France also that made similar claims. I think the Sufisians were the major group probably in, in this vein. Um, so, um, and uh, here again, I think there's one point that I need to make and that is um, how, to, um, how to situate this group in the context of Freemasonry. And uh, this is what is called, it's, it's, uh, I said it's paramasonic in the sense that it does not fall within the, the general parameters of, uh, uh, you know, accepted Freemasonry, so to speak. Um, and, and, and so uh, because of the Egyptian right, needless to say, but it is also a sy system in French, you say, au grade, right, advanced degrees. In other words, you already needed to be a member of a Masonic Lodge and you needed to have passed through the three basic degrees in order to be a, be, be a viable member, right, to, to be able to access the system. And so um, it's, it's a system of uh, advanced degrees that is based on a regular Masonic Lodge, which is called the Lodge of the Frère Artiste, so the Brother Artist. And that was a lodge that uh, came about, you know, basically at the end of the 18 teens and 
these were people who were all associated with the theater when they call themselves the frere artists the you know theater brothers of the theater theatrical brotherhood we're talking about people associated with these mm, uh, boulevard theaters and so one thing that helped me tremendously break down who the Sophisians were is to look at the annual membership lists of the Frère Artiste and then cross-referencing that with the Sophisian documents. Now, there were some Frère Artiste who never joined the Sophisians for one reason or another, um, but you can clearly see when they appear on these lists, when they tripped in and out. So, um, you know, it's, it's a system of Ograd. It's, it's, you know, advanced degrees, uh, I believe is the term in English, isn't it? Uh, yep. Right. Um, and, and so uh, that's a, an important point. It seems perhaps, uh, again, a, a rather obscure point uh, to make, but one needs to understand that basically this regular Masonic Lodge was the recruiting ground for this um, um, uh, Egyptian Rite Freemasonry. Right. And I think also the other thing is that the documents that I used uh, including these uh, fantastic, well, they are colored too, by the way, you know, watercolor gouache uh, drawings in this manuscript, uh, which is bound in parchment and even has, uh, you know, uh, uh, wonderfully illuminated uh, uh, a cover, all Egyptian style, right, based on actual Egyptian artifacts that they had access to, mostly through prints, right, they looked at Prince, like he even looked at Alexandre Lenoir and people like that. Uh, so uh, in any case, the documents and most of the knowledge that we have about the Sophisians dates from somewhere between 1819, 1818, 1819 through 1821. Cuvillier de Tree dies in 1824. Uh, the Frère Artiste kind of keep on going until 1840. Uh, the golden book that I was talking about is a product of the early 1820s. So although we're talking about a, a, a Napoleonic phenomenon here, and I believe it's fair to say that it was founded during the Napoleonic age, as a matter of fact, the documents and the, the images that we're looking at and the, uh, uh, the, the texts, because they're also texts, um, there are very clear instructions what the initiation looks like, you know, for the uh, the, the aspirin degree, and then um, um, the next degree is a scholar of hieroglyphics, I believe, and uh, the professorship of the great mysteries is the highest degrees or something like that. And uh, uh, so in any case, these, uh, these drawings and documents, as fascinating as they are, they are product of the restoration period. So what, what we're really looking at, uh, you know, in terms of these documents are documents of uh, 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 advanced degree, high degree, paramasonic organization of the Egyptian rite within the context of the restoration period and Napoleonic nostalgia with a strong kind of theatrical bent. Did uh, did they have women members? Because I know, so you know, some forms of masonry and the dominant forms of masonry uh, don't allow women in. Absolutely, yes, and that's something that, of course, also sets them apart. Um, there, there are the so-called uh, adoption lodges for for women, and they had now, given the fact that Sophia is the female personification of Gnostic wisdom here, you know, of course, uh, you know, there's a strong female component. Isis, of course is female, nature is female. Um, and let me get back to the nature thought here in just a moment, right? So they had, you know, they had female members and they are actual depictions of rituals. They are rituals that were specifically written for women, which were a little bit different. I can read you, you know, a passage and they're quite interesting from a textual uh, point of view. But the interesting thing is that they, you know, you have literally, they were, you know, men and women sitting together at these get together. So, uh, you know, a very, uh, um, definitely very emancipated role for women uh, in, uh, in uh, for a Masonic group of that time, right? And, and that was, this was not purely men's club. Um, now, admittedly, as it was typically the case uh, with, 
adoption, loge d'adoption, you know, female uh, loges, they were oftentimes related to the male members. You know, they were husbands or daughters or something like that. Um, but we do have their names and uh, sometimes it's possible to reconstruct their relationships, right? But the interesting point is, again, we have depictions of how they were seated, the seating arrangements, you know, during these rituals. Um, of course, they also got, came together for dinners and, you know, social gatherings. And you, you clearly see that the women are fully integrated into that. And that's also borne out in the text. And moreover, the uh, uh, kind of orientation of the uh, rituals and the secret knowledge that you acquire here uh, is, is also very much geared towards a, a female knowledge and, and, uh, and a female conception of the world. Um, I, I wanted to say one thing about nature, and I think that's very important as well. And so here we're still dealing with the aftermath of the Enlightenment, of course, and as you, I'm sure you and many of our listeners know, uh, that, that was, you know, if you go back to Jean-Jacques Rousseau, you know, speculations about nature, that's very much part of the Enlightenment. And, and, and so they integrate that. And uh, uh, so, uh, you know, in that sense, uh, they, they are product of the Enlightenment, I think, and, and product of Enlightenment thought. Yeah. Um, so you did mention the uh, Napoleon's campaign to, to Egypt. And, and I understand that this sort of started a, a kind of Egypt mania in, mm. in France. Is that true? It wasn't just the, the, the Sosophians. It wasn't just, you know, uh, uh, Egyptian Freemasonry. Is this true that this was a very, the, the, this was a fad, a phenomenon? You know, the, they were crazy for Egypt uh, uh, in France at the time. Is that right? Absolutely. And, and across Europe and North America, as a matter of fact, right? Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, if you take Memphis, Tennessee, you know, I, I mean, that was, I would have to look into, you know, when that name came about, but I think that's also late 18th, early 19th century phenomenon. So it's not confined to France, it's not confined to uh, to Europe even for that matter. So Egyptomania was a, a widespread phenomenon uh, in, in, especially in the early 19th century. And the Egyptian campaign of Napoleon Bonaparte triggered it as short-lived as it was as an actual event. Uh, one document that uh, is absolutely amazing and had a huge impact uh, was the so-called, in English, the Napoleonic description of Egypt, uh, the description de l'Egypte. And Napoleon and his administration took it upon themselves after the end of the campaign to commission uh, a monumental set of volumes containing basically prints, engravings, documenting very comprehensively uh, the antiquities of Egypt, the monuments, the, uh, the pyramids themselves, uh, archaeological finds, um, and then moving on to contemporary Egypt, you know, including uh, Islamic monuments, the contemporary cities of Egypt, uh, geographical surveys of the country, um, uh, fauna and flora. You know, it's again going back to the idea of the Enlightenment, uh, this idea of having a vast encyclopedia of Egypt. And uh, these volumes are also oversized. They they are the size of a table. I'm not not kidding you, and and very very large. And uh, they were seen and intended at this time as, as a major accomplishment in science. This was seen as cutting edge scientific uh, description of Egypt, uh, comprehensive at that too, which of course is, you know, kind of, you know, no longer something we would subscribe to today or how we, we, we know that knowledge is, uh, it's not finite, but that was the enlightenment, the enlightenment belief, knowledge to be finite kind of. Um, and, and so this was published and it, it created then uh, for many, many years, um, a compendium of uh, design references of various sort, hieroglyphics galore, of course, all over the place, uh, you know, and it, it was so thorough, you know, they, they copied all the inscriptions in the temples and they did recreations of the temples for how they thought they looked like when they were built including the color, they hand colored these engravings. 
and it became an enormous resource book for um, art and design, for artists, architects. And before long, you have buildings, you have cemeteries, you know, uh, you know Egyptian style cemetery near Boston, for instance, um, interiors, and yes, a lot of Masonic temples. There's some pretty amazing Egyptian style Masonic temples in, 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 in Belgium, for instance. Um, uh, so in any case, yes, it set off this fashion fad for Egypt in a similar sense that the finding of the uh, of the tomb of King Tutankhamun in the 20, 1920s set off another wave of, of Egyptomania. It had the same effect and, uh, uh, and, and of course all rendered in this very severe, uh, almost neoclassical black and white style of these engravings. Um, now there is also it's an interesting moment in egyptology as well because um before that you had people like well Cagliostro obviously was not a you know a serious figure not a scientific figure we can all agree on that and people at that time agreed to that mm -hmm. um but there was alexandre lenoir for instance uh, who's a very interesting figure and you know basically saved a lot of the monuments, you know, a lot of the churches, the fragments of vandalism during the French Revolution, he saved all of these monuments, uh, these fragments and put them all together in a museum. But he was really taken by uh, Egyptian speculation. And, and he published about that. And that was very much seen as cutting edge. And also, this is all pre Champollion. So nobody could read hieroglyphics. Um, and, you know, Champollion's accomplishments, they are kind of contemporary with the Sufisians, but really a little bit later. So, so that does not figure. So the whole, what we would describe today as a scientific investigation of ancient Egypt um, is in its infancy as best or has not happened yet. And, you know, the, the, the references are still Athanasius Kircher, for instance, and, and uh, you know, uh, I, I mean, other texts that, uh, that are you know, 17th, 18th century texts about Egypt and, uh, you know, but even up to and including Alexandre Lenoir, who was, you know, a mystic, if you want, or at least the way he looked at, at Egypt. Now, he had never traveled there, he'd never seen the country. He was basically looking at other texts and looking at the few monuments that were available. Yeah, you know, a really important uh, question uh, that perhaps I should have put er uh, you know, earlier in my question sheet is, is Napoleon and his relationship to Freemasonry, or I should also maybe talk about maybe the circle around Napoleon or mm -hmm. the, the power base of Napoleon, but didn't he use and he and his supporters kind of use uh, Freemasonry and Masonic symbolism as, as a form of propaganda? Yes, there's no doubt about that. Uh, he uh, used uh, Freemasonry, he, uh, even there were lots of speculations that were put into the world very deliberately by his administration that he himself was initiated during the Egyptian campaign uh, to Freemasonry, that he was initiated in the pyramids. Uh, you know, of course, these are all legends, but these were legends that were very deliberately crafted. Uh, the, the purpose of these legends was to assure the support of uh, Masonic lodges. Uh, the Napoleon administration understood that uh, uh, the political support of Freemasons was important and, and uh, therefore there were these legends being crafted about Napoleon, of course, being a Freemason himself, whether true or not, I don't know, you know, I wouldn't want to make a judgment call, but there's whole books, uh, there's interestingly enough, I'm, I'm just looking at it, uh, there's a book that came out in the first edition, it, it said in French title, uh, Napoleon Freemason. And then there was a second edition, Napoleon Franc-Masson, question mark, right? <laughs> uh, so in any case, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a problem that, that I, I don't think I want to, you know, I'm not in a position to make a final judgment on whether or not it's true and probably it's impossible to, to find that question. But what, what is certain is that um, these were, uh, uh stories legends uh, that were deliberately planted to assure uh, that the, the the freemasons were in support of napoleon bonaparte right and and that was a very important 
it, it is political. Yes, it, it was a matter of political support and uh, crafting legends such as this were also in support uh, of Napoleon. And, and here again, when I said before, most of these documents are really products of the restoration period. That's an interesting point because, you know, you're, you're definitely not uh, carrying favors with anybody in the political leadership class during the restoration by showing your Napoleonic support. As a matter of fact, you know, there were censorship laws during the restoration in place during Louis the 18th that you could not show even a silhouette so a shadow of a person wearing a tricorn hat on stage because that was a sign you know that was evocative of, of pro-napoleonic sentiments um and so these people were amongst themselves of course very much napoleonic nostalgics that was the great moment their moment of glory right and and so in that sense they were one could almost say an opposition force of some sort, um, and and that's quite typical. You know uh, that may strike us as strange today. You had a kind of coming together of liberals, political liberals, and uh, Napoleonic nostalgics. And keep in mind that a lot of the people who were in the military during Napoleon Bonaparte really had an axe to grind with the Restoration government. There was first, of course, Napoleon was defeated. And then the Allied forces move in and they cut him a good deal and he sent to Alba and, you know, just stay on Alba and don't come back. And then he does come back and he kind of puts the band back together, right? Mm -hmm. And and puts all of his old buddies back in these places of power. Now, initially after the defeat, they cut them a great deal. They say, you keep all of your pensions, right? Just stay out of politics, right? Everybody got a good, got a good deal, but then they, put did the 100 days the 100 jour and then napoleon is defeated finally right and and he's sent to saint helena he's out of the picture but mm -hmm. these people who rallied to support the second time they get really smacked by this because all of their pensions get reduced by 50 percent, so they only get half of their pension so they were really quite mad at that of course right and and so there are these these napoleon napoleonic nostalgics who are were kind of around, right? Um, now, another thing that's interesting about that from a political point of view, and I think this was one of the questions that you sent me as well, is, uh, you know, charitable, you know, uh, char charitable actions. Yeah. And uh, of course, for Freemasonry, charity is the reason for being. Maybe that that's just, you know, for, uh, you know, we want to be a charitable organization, but really it's about connections and those kind of things. But uh, the, the Sufisians took this very, very seriously. And, and in the Golden Book, there's even, I mean, if you wanted to rise through the ranks and, you know, uh, become an Isiac, right? These are, they're all Egyptian themed ranks and stuff like that. Um, so if you joined the group, you basically had to adopt a poor person and you had to care for that person until that person died so you had you know this lifelong commitment to this poor person um and and so you know they said well this is not just that we don't want this kind of charitable commitment to be just lip service we take it very seriously and Kiribati the tree was very serious about that it, it manifested itself also in another dimension and that is the support of Philhellenism. And that, again, requires um, a, a lot of contextual information because during the 1820s, there's the Greek War of Independence that's going on. And Greece is still under the Ottomans. And uh, so they're trying to break away from the Ottoman Empire and receive a lot of support from um european countries and especially a kind of educated uh, uh, educated intellectuals artists people of that sort um and they consider it a worthy cause they think you know greece the cradle of civilization and these people need to be free 
and and so one of the hotbeds for that becomes Vienna, for instance, for you know the support. There's also a lot of Greeks who stage this uh, uh, and support for the Greek War of Independence, uh, who are uh, who are um, uh, operating from what's today Romania, uh, and so um, intellectual circles uh, in Western Europe, France, England, Germany. Uh, rally to the cause of the oppressed Greeks, and this becomes Philhellenism. And you see it in painting, you know, the Delacroix paintings, uh, Greece on the Ruins of Missolonghi, you know, things like that. These were artworks that were painted in support of the Greek cause. And uh, so they were fundraising. They were fundraising, you know, buying arms for the Greeks, for instance, or Lord Byron, who actually traveled to Greece and was killed there in action supporting, you know, uh, through his own activities, the cause of the Greeks. And and so the, uh, the Sufisians were very active uh, for the Philhellen cause in Paris at this time. Uh, why is that politically significant? Well, the restoration government was officially allied with the Ottoman Turks and, and they uh, supplied arms to the Ottoman Turks. And so now, you know, you have the Sufisians and others saying, okay, if the government provides arms or sell arms to the Ottoman Turks, we need to raise funds to uh, support um, uh, the Philippines and send them arms so that they can battle the Turks. Um, and so there's a lot of fundraising for the Philippian cause going on, which at the same time positions them, positions them in opposition uh, to uh, to the, the the restoration government under under Louis Louis the Eighteenth, there's of course also political dimension because the restoration also meant the restoration of Catholicism to the role of the official you know state religion, and you know if you have a group like like, like the Sufisians, you know uh, there's still a lot of lingering remnants. These are all people who were raised as Catholic. You can sense that, and they can't quite get it out of their system. Um, but, but nevertheless, obviously, this kind of Egyptian mysticism about Isis and uh, Hippocrates and whatnot—you know—that's that's clearly not in line with the biblical teachings or you know the Roman Catholic Church. So, um, you know, they 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 were not people who would necessarily go to mass on Sunday. Um, and uh, so that's kind of interesting as well from, from that point of view. So uh, in any case, you know, the, the philhellenic cause as a charitable cause that they took up had a political dimension. Yeah. Um, the, we touched on their, their origins uh, uh, slightly. And of course, they, they sort of have two origin stories, because as you said, that they, they come and then they come back during the restoration, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. but, but their original origin, um, a lot of these uh, similar groups, uh, like you mentioned, you know, Freemasonry claims to be thousands of years old. It's, mm. it's older, it's, it's before Noah's flood. And mm. and similar parabasonic groups and other esoteric groups, they, they have these mythical histories. But what is the actual origin of, of the the the, uh, the Sophisians? And, and did they have a... Um, uh, a mythical history and like is the origin in in the campaign like you mentioned that so did did did, did they claim to discover something there or did they claim or, or is there no mythological claim it's that we went to egypt and we liked it so much we wanted to bring it to france so uh, if you could, yeah, tell yeah. me a bit about that yes i i think one uh person they reference is hermes trismegistus you know that that is and that's of course a very you know, thorny question, you know, it's not a real person and, and you know, you have a body of hermetic writing and, and so Hermes Trismegistus is kind of, you know, I think the the origin story, or at least that's what they claim. In fact, they have patched it together from, from, from various sources, in, including hermetic writings, some hermetic writings, uh, you know, and ranging from Hermetic writings to Athanasius Kircher and ending up with Alexandre Lenoir, right, and and a whole bunch of other things, and it's a hodgepodge of of these uh, mysterious writings that came before them. But again, as I said, you know, it's not uh, the scientific thought of uh, Champollion, 
that you're dealing with here. Um, and so, but but Hermes Trismegistus, and there's actually depictions of the book of a book on a on a hill inscribed with the name of Hermes Trismegistus. So so that comes up time and time again as a you know, as a as a textual source, perhaps, but then again, you know, Plutarch, right? The the whole uh, story of Isis, and uh, as as a foundation story, legend of of Egyptian history, with the story of uh, Isis and Osiris, and 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 so on. So they uh, they were certainly avid readers of classical texts, of Greek texts. Um, uh, sometimes uh, Diodorus of Sicily comes up, you know, it's a hodgepodge of different textual references uh, and, uh, and, and they uh, put them together in a sometimes haphazard way uh, to, to create their own um, belief structures. But again, I think, you know, the figure of Isis looms very large uh yeah so uh you know that's that's uh, fair to say um perhaps i can uh you know if i find it you know maybe i'll find the text uh, quickly here about the the kind of um, assignment basically um, that one needs to resolve for the the grand mis uh, the professorship of the grand mysteries so if I can find it here very quickly. So in any case, you know, it says, for instance, in order to uh, uh, achieve the professorship of the grand, uh, grand, grand mysteries, you have called, you have to quote, have studied in part of comprehensively natural history in its three ages, morals, philosophy, history, geology, geography, mathematics, physics, medicine, anatomy, philology, astronomy, but while overflowing with human knowledge, the initiate will attach himself to one of the sciences following his taste and deepen it enough eventually to become a professor. You know, that they, they, they almost, uh, you know, it becomes almost a kind of university, right? Uh, that, uh, that um, you know, uh, a structure, but let me just see here. Yeah. Uh, in any case, it's a, it's basically uh, at the end you're being being asked to to speculate about nature, you know, and uh, uh, to 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 engage in that, and it's uh, almost like like writing an essay about that question. Um, and the interesting thing is there that we have, uh, you know, natural scientists such as Fay who wrote treatises that that remind us of of kind of. Uh, you know, a Darwinism or, or, or neo-Darwinism even. So um, there you go, right? Um, yeah, I, I, th I think for modern people, there's this sort of combination of ancient Egyptian gods and uh, the esoteric uh, mysticism mm -hmm. with, with enlightenment values seems yeah. strange maybe to modern people. But of course, this was very common at the time. There's mm -hmm. there's other paramasonic groups doing it, and they are sort of viewing it as, as all one thing, right? Like yes. to know to know nature is to also know religion, right? To know science is to know the mind mm -hmm. of God. Is, is, that, yeah. is, is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. so so they, they, they take it very seriously. So so science is kind of, uh, you know, linked to to mysteries and initiation. Right. Uh, and 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 also, you know, to psychological states, the psychology of this is very, very interesting because it's also the, the rituals are designed to instill fear as well. Right. And and, uh, you know, that's, of course, to some extent true of uh, you know, mas other Masonic rituals as well, uh, but uh, you know, they're very, very interesting kind of kind of passages here about uh, this uh, kind of psychological aspect of it that you need to go through, right, and that you learn something from that about yourself and the world that you're inhabiting. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. 
Well, well, again, maybe uh, sort of a complicated question, but can you tell us a little bit about their beliefs and their and their teachings? You know, what what is it that they they sort of instilled in people, wanted people to know? What is what are the the mystical and religious teachings that are in the Golden Book? Like, did you have to become an ISIS worshiper? Were you out sacrificing bulls to ISIS? Like, how how did it sort of uh, like you know what is well, it that they, uh, yeah, they want yeah, people to believe? Yeah, I I think you know uh, it's a good uh, you know it's it's a little bit of a longer passage here, but I think it's quite vivid. So I'm going to, to read you, and this oh, is my translation, um, you know, that is, let me just see, um, you know, I believe this is the initiation to the, to the scholar of hieroglyphics, right? And so uh, it reads, quote, a cave illuminated by lamp affixed to the walls. As soon as the recipient or the initiate has entered, the stone cut door shuts with a shattering noise and he finds himself locked in on a rock. Tablets have been left that contain the following words. Neophyte, you enter the pyramid by your own free will and you will finish your life in it unless you find the sanctuary of truth. Search, but watch out. The ward is narrow, treacherous and difficult. Water, air and fire, all the elements you conjured will block your passage. If you do not have the courage to face these perils, remain here where you're in safety. Instead of triumphing in the eyes of the world, live unspectacularly in solitude. What glory is to the eagle who challenges the air to behold nature's king of stars, that's the sun, of course. Nourishment is to the owl who avoids the light of the sun by hiding itself in the hole of a solitary and rotting tree. Make your choice, but consider that you need to conquer alone without counsel, by dint of your spirit, by your own courage, by your prudence. Think well, three slaps with your hand of equal length and the word Hermes enunciated three times with a high voice will be the signal of your resolution and will open the door for you uh, to the uh, secret and dangerous exit passage where you need to crawl in order to elevate yourself. After the recipient has given the signal, clapping with his hands. Uh, the, the first underground conduit will be uncovered. He enters by bending over. Soon the canal will become narrower. The neophyte drags himself on his hands and knees, sometimes going uphill, sometimes going downhill. During this difficult crawl, the sound of rumbling boulders in the lateral conduits inspires fear in his soul and an odious stench troubles his senses of smell. One by one, he experiences the tests of the three elements, and amidst the fourth test, he arrives at the well at the bottom of which is truth. He claim, climbs into the well by finding holes in the openings of the decaying walls, and at the bottom of the gaping mouth encounters a unique access opened by his pushing a protruding block that activates an unlocking mechanism. He finds himself in the sanctuary of fantastic illusions, Typhoon and his terrible following block the passage by vomiting fire and flames. The neophyte cannot dissipate the magic spell, but by pronouncing with a raised voice all the sacred words of the previous classes of initiation. Nuzibi, Zuri, Ziz, Kaisa, Demeter, Seri, Horus. Finally, the phantoms vanish completely upon the recipients, pronouncing the name Hermes last. After this triumph, he catches his breath for a moment as the netherworld recedes to obscurity. The voice shouts, get rest, and a chair is approach, uh, it, and a chair approaches the recipient. Keep in mind, this is probably on stage and they are using these stage tricks, right? Yeah. So, uh, and a chair approaches the recipient. He sits down. Immediately, invisible hands cover his eyes. A swift chariot carries him away and thunder accompanies his course. When the chariot stops, the neophyte hears a vague melody. He inhales an air embalmed with perfumes, and remote voices resound with the opening hymn of the mysteries. In vain, demiurge, you veil your essence, etc. That really exists. I actually found the musical scores and the text to that. Um, there is Sufisian music, and the scores have survived in the Bibliothèque Nationale in the Department of Music. At the end of the song, the blindfold falls, and he finds himself on a flower throne, facing the assembled heads of the order in the Temple of Wisdom, all Sufisian and Sufisienne, male and female initiates, decked out in their splendid costumes, surround him and congratulate him. 
right? And and so that's that's interestingly enough. There's a female version. Would you like to? Would you care for the female version as well? Or yes, okay. please. Yeah. Mm. One leads the female neophyte to the cabinet. One gives her the golden key by telling her that it is the one that opens the little door. But open it, she is not allowed to do. She is then left alone. Soon, one will one will know whether her curiosity leads her to use the key. One does everything to let her curiosity gain the upper hand, whether by means of the secret cabinet or by sending in a female friend who convinces her to use this key, the key, or by a remote voice, or by having a male Sophesian talk to her through the closed door, urging her to use the key. If she insists on her refusal to open the secret door, two ladies will enter the cabinet. They congratulate her on her discretion and tell her that she will be given a prize. They'll blindfold her and take her to the rolling chariot. Otherwise, if she opens the door, uh, there issues forth with great noise a winged monster. Two masked male members of the aspirant degree appear. They dress her down with reproaches over her perjury, put her in chains, cover her eyes, and spirit her away with the same chariot. In either case, the uh, reception continues like the one for the man but one does not ask her to explain the hieroglyphics and maxims to the latter. One modifies them by making them sweeter, by letting them, by making them more likable and spiritual. Immediately after this explanation, one accuses the female recipient of a mistake. One demands that she show her courage to punish herself if she is guilty or to tolerate her punishment if she thinks her conscience to be beyond reproach. As soon as she is promised to do so, one presents her with a dagger so that she may slash herself, but hardly has she touched the hilt, the blade changes into a bouquet of flowers. So, uh, in any case, you know, these are... The these, these are so amazing, and uh, I, I can't imagine, you know, what, when you talk about some, some of the psychology, the psychological changes that, mm. that uh, must have happened within people to go through such such uh, elaborate rituals. And, and as you've pointed out, these these were very, the, the tricks, the special effects were, were very impressive, probably by the mm. standards of the time, but also by today's standards, right? You would have yeah. uh, these theater professionals, these very elaborate uh, theaters of all these uh, uh, sets. You know, there wasn't yeah. movies, right? So this, right. this is where people were getting their, their grand, huge entertainment. So, and, yeah. and some of these boulevard plays, so, you know, some of these melodramas, right? They had these these uh, volcanoes erupting on stage yes. and waterfalls. It was new and, at that yeah. time, right? It was relatively new. We would describe it today as a cheap trick, right? Yeah. Uh, but 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 it was it, it was pretty new at that time. And you you mentioned a very important word here, and that is that is entertainment. This was also entertainment, I, yes. I think. Uh, and and uh, yes, it, it it was serious. You know, it had a deeper philosophical quest for truth and knowing oneself, you know, and, and you know, it, in, in many ways it, it had, you know, of course, also uh, a, a relationship, of course, to, to, to Greek philosophy, you know, to very deep-seated questions. Um, although when we talk about ancient Greece, we're talking more, more often than not about the Hellenistic world as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, the, the world of Plato. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so, so in any case, um, yeah, uh, uh, and and uh, but but it's absolutely true that this was also entertainment. I think also the detail that you know, like this story with the dagger that turns into a bouquet of flowers. That's so specific. I think uh, you know that uh, that one uh, you know clearly has to assume uh, that uh, this this was real. You know that uh, you know that a, a lot of it has this specificity. Uh, but then again, uh, you know, there's also, uh, you know, uh, more advanced intellectual things like like writing these essays, uh, you know, where it's it's really about the creation, you know, and life, you know, why is there life and how did it come about? Basically, you know, you had to write for the highest degree, you had to write write an essay. What you what what do you believe is the origin of life on Earth? How did it come about? And that's of course a question that's linked to nature. Right. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and you mentioned the uh, uh, 
you know, there's that Her Heraclitus uh, quote, right? Nature, nature veils herself. Yeah. So that's why, why yeah. uh, an Isis, as you mentioned, in her iconography is shown veiled. And then the ancient Isis, Isis worshippers, the Hellenistic Isis worshippers, right? The, yeah. They had the experience of Isis removing the veil, which was sort of their enlightenment's prime yeah. initi initiatory experience. So, so does Isis sort of become like their main, their main symbol? Because they're, they're trying to understand everything holistically, right? To lift up the veil. So is yeah. that one? One of the one of the things that ISIS really means to them. Uh, yes, uh, I, I I think you know ISIS is is basically a figure also of self knowledge, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know knowledge knowledge of ab about the world, right? And uh, so uh, you know the, 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 there there we go, you know, uh, and and uh, so I yes I think that's absolutely right, you yeah. know that's that's the deeper. The me deeper meaning of Isis, you know, it's the figure of nature, but it has also deep, uh, deep reaching philosophical, uh, you know, implications and uh, ultimately implications about the nature of knowledge, the nature of nature and the nature of being. Yeah. Now, what is it about the art and their visual language that, that grabbed you? Because we didn't talk about your, your background, right? But you, you're you're an art scholar, correct? I'm an art historian, yes. Art historian, yeah. yeah I'm so, an art historian. So what, what, you know, so you know a lot about art. You look a lot, you look at a lot of art. You look at a lot of French art because you mentioned you, you were yeah. doing that work on the Louvre. Mm -hmm. So what is it that grabbed you about, about their art? And I know, again, this is, this is perhaps a subjective uh, question, but is it quote unquote good art, whatever that means by, in your opinion? <laughs> That's an interesting <laughs> question. Um, well, you know, in terms of, well, First of all, we are talking here about the heydays of academic art, Jacques Louis David, and so on. So it, it's clearly not up to these standards. Um, I do believe that uh, a lot of the drawings were done by somebody who possibly passed briefly through the studio of Jacques Louis David named Ponce Camus because he was keeper of the seals. And that also includes the, the, uh, the Livre d'Or, the Golden Book, right? Um, so in any case, uh, Yes, but there, there is a naive touch to these illustrations, uh, you know, also when it comes to perspective or, you know, issues of human anatomy, it's not always up to snuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but that may have been deliberate as well. I think that's not outside of the realm of possibilities. Um, keep in mind also that these documents were, were conceived as working materials. They were not created to be masterworks, to be shown in a museum. This was a book that was, you know, handed to people. And, you know, here is this drawing, although they referred to it, they called it all hieroglyphics and whatnot, but they're, they're really drawings. And interpret that for us. If you want to get, get, get ahead, go, go ahead and, you know, rise through the ranks of this association. So, <laughs> So in any case, that's, um, and, and so one needs to think of it as well as a, as a prop. The book itself was part of the prop. It was part of the initiation ceremonies. It was handled during the initiation ceremonies in various forms. So um, yeah, I think it, it, it belongs more to the largely lost world of all of these suffusion props and they did have props and the props played a very important role yeah and um when you said the uh so you know the, as part of their and you know the the initiations right they went through these different mm -hmm. degrees and as 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 part of passing the degree, it wasn't just a ritual. They, they would pass you the book, they would point to an, an image, and you would have to give an explanation of, of that image. Mm. Is, is, is the explanation uh, predetermined? Is, is there a correct interpretation that, the, that, that the, initi the initiated has to give? Or if they are able, or, or is it that they're able to give an interpretation that perhaps is completely original, but is using, you know, the knowledge that they've studied? It's interesting. It seems to connect to the images. Which, which was it in that case? That's a great question. Fantastic. Yeah. Very good. Um, yeah, so uh, it's, um, one needs to differentiate, I think, first of all, uh, you know, in Freemasonry, you have, like, you know, in, in, in Catholicism or Christianity, you have catechism, as a matter of fact, and there are certain standard questions that one needs to know and one needs to answer. And there are 
such catechisms for the Sophisians. In fact, they do exist, but they are being used uh, basically for the um, for the new initiates. Okay, and as they rise through the ranks, and especially as they get to the scholar of hieroglyphics and then professorship of the grand mysteries, it is really something where you need to form your own opinion you know where you need to synthesize information and where the answers are open-ended right and um i can i can uh, you know um uh, i can i can read you this little passage here uh, this is for the class two degree in arts and sciences of the professorship of the grand mysteries and the initiate had to kind of grapple with the following question and i'm going to read it and again it's from the golden book uh, first hypothesis to be developed from the hyssop, that is the herb to be used in mosaic rites of purification to the oak, from the ant to the elephant, nature seems to strive to march from perfection to perfection. Is not the single stem of the polyp, the first sketch, the primordial type of marvelous interior of man, at once the most complex and the most perfect being? Why did perfection stop at this point? was the creator incapable, that would be impossible if man is the last echelon uh, of the sub sublunar beings. Does the latter end with man? Why does it not lead step by step from the good to the better by rendering matter diaphanous and striving towards aerial intelligence up to the level of pure spirit, the perfect point of its immersion in the source of life? of mixing and aggregation of divine essence, of the reunion of the soul of all things with nature. Man always hopes this vague hope. Is it not the word for the enigma of death? So these are things one should speculate about. And I think there's interesting things embedded. These are kind of rhetorical questions to some extent, of course, and, uh, but, you know, there's also a developmental story here, and I interpret it also as embedded in it, almost a Darwinian theory of, uh, you know, an evolutionary theory, um, but it's, it's mixed in with other things, you know, it's the Masonic story of self-perfection that comes across very strongly it's also the, the grappling with uh, mortality. And of course, again, back to the issue then, what is nature ultimately? Yeah. Mm. Well, unfortunately, we, we have to start wrapping up and, you know, there's tons more questions I could ask, but I, I guess an, an important one to, to end the show with is, is, mm. is what happened to them. Well, they, they fizzled out. It's it's very funny, and I, I I very much got the impression that Cuvier de Tree, and I actually found his grave. It's on the Père Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. It can still be visited, and uh, it's uh, not to be missed. Uh, it's uh, it's a miniature pyramid, as a matter of fact, as his gravestone, um, and um, I very much had the impression that the this um, kind of second wave of Sufisians, and mind you, the there's very little that is hardly anything that's left of the first Sufisians. I think they did exist. I think they were real. But, you know, again, you know, it's by chance even that this golden book exists, you know, that could have gotten lost as well. But um, so um, the, I have the impression that Cuvillier de Tree really had this group together. And, and I, I also think he was quite an eccentric. Um, he left, again, a huge uh, body of um, plays that nobody reads today, you know, uh, but you go to the library of the National, uh, the, the catalog of the National Library in Paris and you can pull up um, something like 150 or so plays and I found some that are not even in that catalog. And I read many of them, I did not read all of them, um, but it gives you a good sense of, you know, who this person was. And you also find similar descriptions of what's happening behind stage with a similar kind of quote, what I would call tricks, you know, special effects if you want. Um, so in any case, it, it has a similar structure in that sense. Um, but I did have the impression very much that it all hinged upon him and he held these people together and he died in 1824. There was a successor, a guy named Fouché, who was from the south of France and 
He was in the Napoleonic administration. He was really bureaucrat. I believe he was also, you know, with the police or something. And you know, it, it, it seems to fizzle out. The, the prayer artists keep on going longer, but there's fewer and fewer evidence. Once you get into the 1830s, in particular, fewer and fewer evidence that the suffusions are still going on. So I think really Kiriji the Tree was a driving force, and he. Because he had all of these contacts, uh, you know, other playwrights, and, and keep in mind these, these uh, boulevard theaters, there were lots of people employed there, so he wrote the plays, but there were actors, there were musicians, um, uh, people who created these stages, Ponce Camus, the artist I referred to, was uh, presumably also somebody who did stage sets there. So, uh, you know, he had access, he had a large social circle, and he used the social circle to keep these people together. And then he died in 1824, and they keep it going for a little bit. But I think it was really his charisma that held it together. Yeah. Well, the name of the book is Napoleon Sorcerers, the Ephesians. I highly recommend that you read it, buy a copy, buy 10, buy one for all of your friends. And uh, some people will be watching this on YouTube. Some people will be listening to it as a podcast. But I've, uh, I've thrown up uh, where people can find you, your LSU page. But uh, mm -hmm. if people want to contact you, know more about your work, that's where they should go. Is that right? Uh, that's okay yeah. yeah i'll also put that in for for those uh listening I'll, I'll put the link in the the show notes and it'll also be in the show notes on youtube so definitely check out uh dr speed's page um okay wow i i guess it's time to wrap up i wish we could go longer there's so much more to talk about but uh it's been it's been really awesome thank you so much well thank you so much john true pre pleasure being on the program and uh, yes it's a huge topic and uh, thank you very much for kind of giving me the time to develop all of these things and uh you know yes thank you very much looking forward to continuing the conversation sometime in the future anytime okay bye everybody yeah, bye now good